I, I try to give you a background of, of what we are doing also in the eco project, but also a general tool that uh, I'm developing. Uh, basically, this the, 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 let's say the the code. The, the key code uh, in the eco project is this Liban EGF that we are trying to develop and, and scale on HPC. Uh, as Lib say, it's a library for non equilibrium greens function and it therefore needs to be linked to, to some code. And the most advanced code to which is linked at the moment is this other code, the FTB plus. I will try to explain to you what it's all about. And we will try to do some practical calculations over the, the interface on the portal. So, but, but I decided to take it a bit from a distance. Probably many things are well known, uh, other less, but let's start from the very simple basics just to align everybody. Uh, what photovoltaics is uh, and um, of course, the very beginning or the, the starting of everything is the famous silicon PN junction that probably most of you know. But just to remind you that uh, what, what it's all about, of course, we have um, silicon is of group four material like carbon. We will work uh, later on mainly on carbon, uh, graphene nanoribbon, basically. And we will see things uh, on the carbon side uh, because silicon is a bit more involved. Uh, but but of course silicon is group three, a uh, group four, sorry. And, and if you if you dope with group uh, five material, for instance phosphorus or arsenic, you typically have uh, an atom that substitute a silicon atom sits there, and there is an extra electron because of valence. And these extra electrons turns out to be mobile that can diffuse around. On the other side, you can dope with the boron, aluminum, gallium, and you have group three materials. And here you have a, a lack of electron uh, that behaves like uh, a particle and it's a hole. When you join together these two, uh, something interesting happens. You, you have the so-called PN junction. And the PN junction, okay, the, the most important concept is the Fermi level. <clears throat> if you dope uh, N type, the Fermi level moves towards the conduction bands. The more you dope, the more it goes towards the conduction band. If you dope really uh, heavily, 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 per centimeter square, uh, the, the, the Fermi level start to enter inside the band. So you have lots of, of free carrier, free electrons. On the other hand, if you dope heavily P, you have a lot of, of free holes. If you put a junction together, the equilibrium, thermodynamical equilibrium is reached and the electrochemical potential, which is represented by this, the Fermi level is the electrochemical potential align. Uh, and this is the most important concept we will also see later on. And this alignment uh, in equilibrium produces a built-in field internal field in the junction. And this is the key point of, of, then, uh, of this object that is basically a device that behaves uh, as a re rectifier, basically. If we apply a positive voltage on this side, for instance, positive voltage, okay, yeah, we have to play with the sign convention of the electrons. The electrons is as a negative sign. So a, an electron in a positive voltage as basically a negative energy minus E times V. So if you apply a positive voltage, uh, whenever you apply a positive voltage, you drag, you drag down the energies, the bands. So if you think, sorry, if you think at this junction, if you apply a positive voltage here, uh, the, this barrier basically start to, to be decreased uh, and an electron uh, current can flow. If you apply a negative voltage on the other end, you, you push up <clears throat> the bands and then the current is blocked. And this is basically giving, why is it going this way? This is basically giving the behavior of a rectifier. Uh, the PN junction behaves as a rectifier. Current can flow in the positive voltage direction and doesn't flow in the negative voltage direction. 
okay, one may say that there is a little bit of current in the negative voltage due to these minority car carriers. There are few minority carriers that can, can carry some current even in the backward, uh, in the reverse bias PN junction, but this is small typically, let's say negligible. So this behaves like a, a rectifier actually. And um, the good thing is that if we shine light on this junction, um, well, the simple way to see it is that you create uh, photocarriers and the built-in field is able to separate the photocarriers quickly, especially in, in the junction. And that produces a, um, a current, basically a photocurrent, if you close the circuit or, or um, uh, if you keep the circuit open, this produces um, uh, an open circuit voltage. A more sophisticated way to see the, the, the same thing is that because of the generated, um, the, the generation due to the light, the quasi Fermi level inside the junction split. So you have uh, uh, an electron quasi Fermi level that we can call mu n uh, and a whole quasi Fermi level that we can call mu p and they split in the junction uh, like in this kind of diagram <clears throat> and, and this correspond to um, a VOC voltage basically across the device. These devices then what what you see basically is um, the, the, the PN junction behaves as a generator. And uh, you have um, a, a short circuit current. Basically, this is the famous uh, plot in the third quadrant. Then everybody shows it reverse. I mean, you, you always put it with um, negative current. I mean, you, you, you put it back in the first quadrant, but originally, uh, rigorously, is in this third quadrant. If you put a, a light, you have a, a negative current actually going through. And it's basically this, it's a rigid, almost rigid shift of the IV uh, dark uh, current, dark uh, IV characteristics of the diode shifts down. And the more light you, you put, the more light you shine, the, the higher the current, at least ideally. <clears throat> And um, in, in fact, in practice, the short circuit current is also controlled quite a lot by recombination losses that has to be avoided as much as possible. That's why you need uh, ultra pure material or other tricks. We will have a look. <clears throat> the VOC is mainly controlled by band gap. So the doping, the metallic contacts that you need to put to, to collect uh, the, the photocarriers. So um, VOC is more controlled by uh, electronic uh, properties and, and uh, the current is controlled by recombination losses. So this is a very basis. The, there was already in 1961, a ultra famous paper, this shockley quassier limit that was basically saying Okay, if we have a silicon, maybe even ultra pure, pure crystal, a uh, single PN junction, what, what is the maximum efficiency we can extract from, from this? Efficiency now means power, uh, solar uh, incident light power, and basically how much that power is converted into electricity power, and, and which is basically the product of current times voltage. Now, if we go back one second here, the maximum power point is typically around here, where you have the, the maximum area practically uh, of this re almost rectangular. Uh, ideally, a generator should be a, a perfect rectangle like ISC, and then you have a VOC uh, and, and the product, the maximum point where you have maximum current and maximum voltage is the maximum power point or the maximum power you can you can extract current times voltage is power in, in practice you always have a, a curve like that and the maximum power point is around here okay you can calculate where is the maximum point of, of product of current times voltage but typically is around here 
Um, so, and that's the ratio between incident light power and power extracted in terms of electrical power. So this famous paper sets a limit, a limit uh, in a single junction that is around, uh, okay, in the original paper was calculated around 29, 30% uh, with a little bit of revising is around 33%, but roughly the same. Uh, the limit of a single junction um, as a rule of thumb is 30%. And if you, if you see this plot is interesting also, the, the efficiency depends on the gap. That means this is the power of, of the sun uh, arriving to Earth. Uh, and you have a typical black hole and um, black body radiation of a given temperature. But there are a lot of absorption that is uh, from, from the air, basically, from the atmosphere. So these, these all these voids are uh, light that is absorbed by, by the atmosphere. So what, whatever comes down to ground uh, is more or less this standardized uh, irradiance plot. And now, of course, there, there is a lot of, uh, there are lots of photons that uh, arrive uh, with low wavelength in the infrared, red infrared. If we use silicon, they, they are not absorbed. They, they just pass through because the band gap is too long, too large. The band gap of silicon is around 1.10, 1.12 EV. So all this light, uh, silicon is transparent essentially to all this uh, radiation. And then there is all this part, let's say, visible and UV that is absorbed well, but it's so well absorbed that in fact, uh, electrons are excited a lot in the band, but they relax quickly the, their energy uh, and they thermalize basically to, to the, towards the, the, the bottom of the, um, of the conduction band, let's say, and they all relax towards the bottom of the valence band. So you lose that power as well. Please. Okay, so basically, the actually converted power is this uh, yellow shaded line. And calculation based on a typical uh, band gap, the amount of photon you absorb, the amount that the maximum band gap of silicon basically sets this limit of 30%. And interestingly, the best band gap would be around 1.35, 1.4 which is maybe closer to the band gap of gallium arsenide, which is exactly 1.4. And in fact, gallium arsenide typically gives a higher efficiency. Unfortunately, it's a bit, a lot more expensive than silicon, and so uh, cannot be used on any, <laughs> on all our roofs like we would like to. Uh, but um, silicon, it doesn't behave so badly. The record efficiency for um, single crystal silicon is 26.7, actually. So uh, um, what should we do? What, why there is this, still this gap between the maximum theoretical efficiency and the actual ceiling and the actual productive production material? Uh, and, and of course, this is laboratory uh, record of 27.6 in, in, in actual life, even the best panel uh, I take Sun Power as a good production pro factory that produces very efficient panel. They go around a bit higher than 20%, 20, 22%. Uh, so there is still a, a big gap between theory and uh, what we can do. Okay, I mentioned recombination losses. One <clears throat> big idea um, that is around several years is this silicon heterojunction solar cell. And I mentioned this especially because this was the focus of, of the eco project. Uh, essentially the idea is to put uh, a sort of spacing, a spacer between the contact and, and, the, and the beautiful, pure, ultra pure crystalline silicon, a uh, spacer based on, on amorphous silicon essentially. So build a PN junction but separate this interface somehow with uh, an intrinsic 
amorphous silicon thin layer. Uh, remember that doping is introducing also impurities. Doping is a nice uh, thing to do, but, but you also introduce impurity in the material. So it, these impurities in the end are also recombination centers and they tend to, yeah, they tend to favor uh, recombination losses. So one idea is exactly to separate and to make an intrinsic layer that separates the, the PN junction basically from where you, you generate uh, photocarriers. And this indeed is able to reduce the, the sort of surface passivation layer of amorphous silicon intrinsic are able to reduce a lot uh, the, the recombination losses. In fact, the record efficiency now uh, of Kaneka is around 27.6%, uh, which is approaching the theoretical limit of, of silicon. But, but of course, this is not anymore the single PN junction that starts to be a more sophisticated device. But that was the focus of the eco project. That's why I think it's important to, to, to remember. And I will talk about that later on. Um, one key idea is, okay, we should try to absorb more light everywhere around. And this is the multi-junction solar cell idea. Uh, so basically tailoring different material with different gaps putting them together in a, in a stack. So we have a series of, of junction, basically. Uh, indeed, if you look at a typical multi-junction uh, stack, you have, uh, you put the NP, 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 basically three diodes in, in series. And therefore you have, um, basically you increase the, 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 the VOC. And, and you have to try to balance everything in such a way that you don't reduce the current. Basically you have um, three junction in series. And the idea is to absorb different bands in the best possible way of, of, the, of the incident uh, solar light. So you absorb with germanium, for instance, that has a narrow band gap, you can absorb on the infrared with the uh, appropriate indium gallium arsenide you absorb in the middle and with uh, a little bit higher band gap like uh, indium gallium phosphide, you absorb the blue light. And this gives indeed record efficiency of almost 50%, 47%. Of course, these are very expensive to, to build, but, but they also uh, um, break, let's say the single junction shockley quassier limitation. Then we approach the idea of quantum wells and, and where, let's say that the quantum world start to, to come into the picture of these solar cells. Uh, the idea is to, okay, let's think at one of these junction uh, and, and we start putting, um, a multi-junction inside the junction, basically. The, the idea is to try to, to extract some uh, little bit more car, a uh, little bit more uh, photons than what will be extracted by a single junction. Basically, if you think at a multi-quantum well of different layers of uh, alternating material, like, uh, for instance, aluminum gallium arsenide and indium gallium arsenide. Now, indium gallium arsenide, whenever you have uh, indium, uh, or as, as you move down in the periodic table with elements, they become heavier and the, the gap usually goes down, or actually always goes down. So indium gallium arsenide has certainly a lower band gap than the aluminum gallium arsenide because aluminum is higher up in the in the periodic table uh, gallium nitride is the highest band gap possible basically like uh, yeah, several EV. so if you put together this this material in an heterostructure not easy to to grow there are all these problems of uh, strain compensation and things like that to avoid uh, defects but basically 
or ideally you would you, you grow a system that has a band profile uh, artificial band profile like uh, it is drawn here so narrow band gap wherever you have gallium arsenide say and then then uh, sort of barriers in the aluminum arsenide and so on so what what happens here basically when a photon arrives is able to photo excite to absorb light at slightly lower band gap than the average uh, material it's basically trying to uh, able to 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 photo excite carrier that have uh, slightly lower energy now the problem is okay you have photo excited this carrier you you still have to extract them there is a, there are barriers so the, the game here is to make a, a balance between <clears throat> these two materials, alternation, such that it's not too difficult to, to extract the carrier. You see they have to tunnel through, um, introducing the concept of tunneling through the barrier or, or being, um, let's say, thermally, thermally excited above this barrier. Remember that we are working typically at room temperature or, or above. So the carrier has always a probability because of the Fermi function, Fermi distribution. There is a chance that the, the carrier has a energy to overcome this barrier. And there is also this tunneling effect that we are going to, to study a bit more in detail. So yeah, the game is really to, to tailor the, these devices in such a way that you can extract uh, a bit more energy than the, um, than the average band gap, uh, and you can still uh, take out the carriers in a sort of efficient way. Uh, so typically, if you manage to, to grow, this is an example of what happens for a hundred period, uh, um, hundred period of uh, this, uh, strain balance, uh, indium gallium arsenide, uh, gallium arsenide phosphide, uh, multi-quantum well, and um, this is compared to the original junction. And you see that indeed you, you, you extract a bit more current because you, you are able to absorb more photons. You lose typically a bit of VOC because the, the average, let's say, potential um, is a little bit lower. In the end, the, the idea is to try not to lose too much VOC and increase ISC and, and therefore to, to increase the, the, the extracted power. The demonstration here shows that uh, a few years ago, I think, yeah, this demonstration showed that you have still a, an increase of efficiency, although not spectacular, but, um, but still an increase of efficiency. So uh, is a demonstration that the multi-junction, multi-quantum well can, can work in principle to increase the efficiency of the junction. Then the idea is, of course, to put, um, to substitute all these single uh, junction in the multi-quantum and the multi-junction solar cell to this uh, multi-quantum well. So altogether, you enhance uh, the, the, the efficiency. Of course, here it is not easy to, to, to break the records. To go from 47% to even to 48%, you need big, big efforts. Now we, we start, uh, maybe I'm taking it a bit too long. You can interrupt me if you like. But I wanted to introduce you to, to why quantum, basically. These quantum well are like uh, artificial atoms in the end. Uh, they are known as artificial atoms where you are really in the quantum uh, realm. There are many ways to simulate them. Uh, one way is to is a semi-classical approach. Uh, you compute the wave functions uh, with a Schrodinger solver. So like here, you have all these, you have the potential. You parameterize your materials with, I don't know, some, some Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian uh, description. We can we, go, we will go in the details a bit later. Uh, and a simple, uh, very simple is an effective mass uh, approximation, for instance, if you know what I'm talking about. 
and you calculate, you, you give that to, to a Schrodinger solver and calculate the eigenstate, basically the, the wave function. They will look like this draw. They will look like localized, different energy levels uh, correspond to waves that are localized in different positions of your, uh, of your multi-quantum well. This is actually a picture I found for a, for the opposite is a is a quantum cascade laser actually so it's a, it's a light emitter rather than a light absorber but there is a famous paper recent a few years ago that says that uh, states that a good solar cell is also a good uh, emitting device light emitting device and vice versa there is a complementarity so somehow things are sort of complementary but the, the point is that you can cal calculate wave function you can calculate rates, like using the famous Fermi golden rules, rate be between what? Uh, the rate, for instance, of this wave to move, to go to, to, to for the electron that is described by this wave, to go into, to move the, the next cell, or to recombine, or to do whatever, to absorb a photon, uh, to, to emit, to recombine, etc. So all these rates are com computable, calculatable by knowing after knowing this wave function. This is the most famous formula in quantum mechanics, probably. It's called the Fermi Golden Rule, basically, that allows you to compute uh, rates uh, from the wave function. And this V is what is the perturbation potential? It's the potential that actually allows a transition from an initial to a final state. Once you have all these rates, you can start solving master equations, for instance, as rate equations, and you solve the dynamics, basically, of, the, of an ensemble of carriers uh, around your device. This is the typical way uh, this ensemble are solved typically by Monte Carlo simulation, for instance. Uh, and this is a typical approach, uh, we can, I can say semi-classical, because uh, it's a classical in the master side, in the rate equation, and it's quantum because you need to calculate the wave function to get decent uh, accurate rates. However, this approach is neglecting a lot of things. It's neglecting the fact, for instance, that these wave function are changed because of the interactions. If, you, if your carrier interacts with, uh, with a phonon, um, of course, there is a rate uh, in the end, but uh, of phonon absorption, for instance, but the phonon itself is able to, to change the state of the particle. So there is a so-called renormalization of the energy of the, of the carrier because of the interaction with the photons, with the phonons, or, or with, ad, with the other electrons. This object also, this simple approach is completely neglecting the broadening of the energy levels. Uh, you know that if you have, a, uh, because of the uncertainty principle, if you have a, a, a rate of scattering, um, there is a connected broadening or lifetime in the energy space. Broadening means that uh, an energy is not well defined by a sharp, level or a delta function, but it becomes blowered. Then this is neglecting accurate tunneling between one well to, to, to another, because, okay, this can give you an approximation of, of a tunneling event, but uh, is not uh, precise. And this is still a first order uh, scattering uh, matrix element is not uh, it completely neglects higher order processes like two photon absorption or two phonon uh, or one phonon and a photon uh, at the same time so it's is not quantum in in the essence so this is why in the end uh, uh, the motivation to go to, to something more sophisticated and um, and to describe uh, transport in, in such systems with a, with a quantum approach. So, okay, open quantum systems. In the end, we have a quantum system 
that is driven out of equilibrium because of light or because of a voltage uh, bias applied, whatever. It's a, it's an open system, open because at the end uh, we, we we mean that we have uh, contacts and the electron go away from our device, so it's open. It's interacting. Uh, carriers do interact with each other, interact with phonon, with photon, with impurities. Uh, so it's a, it's a many body problem and in non-equilibrium. So basically it's a, it's a huge problem uh, to, to solve. There are different approaches for this. And one, so to, to treat the quantum mechanical side of this problem, one approach is the Green's function approach that is uh, relatively simple for a single particle formulation, which is what we will work today, but it can be extended uh, systematically in a very elegant way to, to many body uh, interactions. And this was already introduced by Caroli, but actually the Green's function has been uh, introduced a lot earlier in the solid state uh, world. To treat the electron-electron interaction, a typical approach is density functional theory. That is a super famous theory to substitute the many electron interacting with each other with an effective single particle. An effective single particle that feels in a special way uh, the other particles with some in a, in a with a functional that depends on the carrier density. This was also connected to transport uh, in, recently, let's say 20 years ago, and that gave the starting to all the many codes doing uh, quantum, quantum transport uh, connected or coupled to, to density functional theory. Okay, this part uh, we will not see much in detail today, actually, because start to, to, to enter too much into complications. Okay, so if you want to interrupt me up to this point uh, or have any question, or I can move on. I want to give you a um, short mathematical introduction of what we are going to do, uh, at, at least the basics of the of the story. If you do Schrodinger equation, I wrote here the, the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, um, which is writable in this very compact form, where psi is the actually the, the, yeah, the wave function of the system. If we, if we will look all the time at steady state, my Libanigf uh, library actually is only working at the moment uh, at steady state. So basically Fourier transform to energy and, um, and then you have the, to solve the famous uh, steady state Schrodinger equation that is an eigen problem where you need to solve for the wave function, the eigenstate and the eigen energies. We can do similar things. This in the end is an operator, right? It's a, it's a differential equation because you know the Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy of the electron that is a Lap Laplacian in the end. It's a nabla square. Then you have potential. So this operates on this object, on this uh, state. Is a linear operator, actually. We can solve the same uh, kind of uh, function, um, differential equation with the use of Green's function. In fact, Green's function is, is a way to, to solve differential equation, which also embed the boundary condition. What is the trick? If you think at this uh, equation, you can bring uh, everything on, on one side, on the right-hand side, let's say, all the operators, and on the, actually the left-hand side, sorry, and on the right-hand side, you put uh, an impulse. Uh, if you work in time, this is a delta function of time. Uh, typically, you have two times in, in this object. You have, uh, but then you have also translational, typically in steady state, you have 
time after this the, 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 some transient have, have passed uh, nothing change let's say when when you reach steady state so you can fully transform but but in principle you have uh, a time where you put uh, the your your impulse a delta function and and then you look at what happens after that time or before that time you can even look what happened before mathematically at least uh, if you look what happens after, so for t greater than t prime, we, we are talking about the so-called retarded Green's function. On the opposite, you're looking at the, uh, if you look at t lower than, less than t prime, you're looking at the advanced Green's function. In, in energy, that maps to this object. If you fully transform that, uh, basically, the derivative over time, like here, becomes energy. The Hamiltonian is is uh, age, and in energy, this retardation concept maps into a small imaginary part. We will look in a second why, but this is the key one key ingredient. We are working all the time in the complex plane. So we, uh, we are working always with complex uh, mathematics and complex uh, object. This G retarded basically becomes a, a complex matrix and energy itself, okay, wherever you stay in the real axis, it, it's the real energy, but you can go around in the complex plane uh, and that's very useful for calculations. And the delta in Fourier space becomes one if you have just the one number. If you have um, many states, becomes the identity matrix. And also G is, is a matrix. So in fact, the Green's function embeds as many information as much as the wave function, just in a different language. If you want, if you think uh, when you solve this eigen problem, you have N, vectors of size n each so you have n by n uh, n by n uh, say uh, degree of freedom if you want an information of n numbers and vectors that each has n entries and the greens function is a matrix n by n so the, the, the information amount is the same just mapped in, in a different way What we can do with this Green's function, if you think at a single energy level, imagine just one energy level. Uh, you have an energy level and we look at this retarded Green's function. Now I explicitly put a finite, uh, in principle, it's this, this zero is a limit of a small number that tends to zero from the positive side. It's a delta. In practical numerical calculation, you need to put a number which is finite, not, not zero. If you put zero, everything diverges. You need to put a small number. Uh, we will set it to, to something later on. So what this positive small number is doing is doing a very elegant trick. When you fully transfer back to time, if you put a positive delta, uh, you can prove with the complex uh, complex um, contour integration that this maps into a never side function. So if you put a positive delta, you have uh, um, in the if you could go back to time, you have this positive uh, never side function, and this indeed is a proof if you want that this is the retarded uh, object that is is non-zero only for t larger than, than zero. Okay, here we, we mapped also t minus t prime. Here t minus t prime has been relabeled t. So we have just one, one time. So we, we put uh, an impulse in the system at t equals zero. And we uh, automatically, if we put a plus i delta in, in the energy space, it's like looking in time at t that is greater than zero. If we put a minus, if the delta is negative, 
we have the advanced screens function that plays the opposite uh, and you have a um, theta minus t. So you look at what happens before. Clearly the, 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 the delta function uh, produces um, a sort of discontinuity in the greens function. You have, to, you have a cusp, uh, a cusp uh, in, the, in the greens between the, what happens before and after uh, t equals zero. So there's no continuity, of course. And, but we will work um, most of the time with the retarded Green's function and the advance is just a complementary object. Now, if you look in energy space and you take the imaginary part of this object, you, okay, you remove this, uh, you take the imaginary part and this imaginary part in the limit that delta goes to zero is a delta. And that's nice. So the, the, the imaginary part of this Green's function, in fact, is the density of states. Basically, we, you, you have a state at energy epsilon alpha. So you have a, in, in energy, that's a delta function exactly at, uh, with a peak at E alpha. Okay, so this Green's function uh, embeds now, of course, we will look at more complicated things, but if you take the imaginary part or something related to that, uh, you get density of states, and this is already useful. Now think, how do we treat open systems? Let's start with the simple biatomic molecule, like a nitrogen uh, H2 molecule. In tie binding formulation, that's um, maps into into a, a two by two matrix. Why? Because you have okay. The the, the assumption is that uh, you start with uh, separated atoms, and you can describe uh, an isolated atom with a wave function of that uh, an eigenstate of that atom, say the the s orbital of the hydrogen atom, with energy epsilon. A, then you bring the two next to each other, that they have the same energy because they are like the same species. If they are two different atoms, then you will see one will be become epsilon A, the other will be epsilon B in these models. If they are the same, they have the same energy. And this off diagonal terms is decoupling between the two orbitals. Probably for many of you, this is obvious, but maybe not for all. Uh, and if you solve this eigen problem, you have the two, you find the two eigen energy of the system. One is the bonding. So the system likes to, to bond with the lower energy and the, and the anti-bonding uh, level. And this is really the essence of, of type binding in the end. Uh, then we, you, we can complicate that to put in many orbitals per atom, uh, complicated, way of writing these coupling matrix elements that depends on distance, that depends on first neighbor, second neighbor, but, but the essence is really the simple, ultra simple two atom model. Uh, so we have two levels. If we have the isolated uh, hydrogen uh, molecule, we have these two levels and the two electrons sits down here because of spin degeneracy. So that the system is bonded with, uh, with an energy. Now let's think what happens if we put contacts to, next to it. We start putting other atoms that can be, I don't know, a metal atoms or whatever, even semiconductor. But let's think uh, in terms of, I don't know, gold atoms next to it, for instance, a metal that doesn't break the molecule in two, like platinum. <laughs> so gold, gold, if you start with a small cluster of atoms, they will also have their own energy level, probably many, that will go all around, uh, all over. Uh, and there will be some state that will start spilling. That there will be a probability for a state, say, at, at this energy to, to stay a little bit also on the molecule, so to, to cross the system. To, this is this, the, the meaning of this dash dot line. So the, the, the electron would like to go from one side to the other. But of course, the, 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 the original hydrogen levels are, are there, sort of, 
they start to hybridize with the, with the contact. Then you, you increase the size of the system of these contacts, and then you, you have more states, more states also on the side, more and more and more in the infinite limit, you have a, a, a continuous density of states in the contact, and the original hydrogen level have been broadened. You see this broadening of the, 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 the merge and broaden with a certain like, like Lorentzian function in the end. Um, the idea of the Green's function is to map uh, all these complicated contacts into the two hydrogen uh, atoms with a self-energy, the so-called self-energy that is an energy dependent object that changes the Hamiltonian if you want, it just adds to it. And then you have, uh, let's say the isolated, uh, you remap the complicated open system of huge problem in principle infinite into again, a finite uh, problem of this simple two hydrogen atoms, uh, but with the self energy. So that the one task is to calculate the self energy. We won't see the details of how the self energy is computed, but in principle it is, uh, it can be computed. Okay, let's start looking at something we will, we will play around this morning is this graphene nanoribbon. Uh, maybe you know graphene is a super famous material and uh, simple enough for ca to calculate in, in reasonable time. Uh, to make it even simpler, you can play with the periodic system, so a, a real graphene, or cut into what is called a nano ribbon and saturate with hydrogen atoms on both sides. This is the so-called armchair nano ribbon because it um, the profile looks like uh, this armchair. Uh, okay, so we are dealing with a with, with an infinite system in practice that extends on both sides infinitely. What we say is we partition the system into into a central region and some. And, and we say, okay, this is a contact, a left lead and the right lead. And there is a, a way based on essentially a recursive formula that allows you to compute exactly the self energy uh, of this object, how this the, the, the semi infinite uh, material a uh, piece of, of, of material renormalizes the central region with these uh, self energies. This is um, something that is written inside uh, this Liban EGF code. So in the end, you, you end up with a Green's function. Okay, this I corrected in some slide for some, this is a minus of course, the, the, the Hamiltonian plus this, this self energy, um, this is a minus, okay. Let's save it. But it doesn't really matter. It's uh, just a definition. You can always define it with a negative sign and that's it. But typically the Hamiltonian and this self energy sum up. And so um, practice you have a minus there. Okay, the idea can be extended. You can treat exactly, I'm not talking about approximation yet, but this is really uh, for a regular system, a regular contact that extend uh, uh, like semi-infinite semi piece of bulk, you can exactly calculate the self-energy of up to a single particle approximation, but, but okay. Apart from some subtleties of many body problem of many electron interacting, you, you can still at a single particle level calculate exactly the self energy. Now the idea of self energy, um, in fact, is known in the Green's function business since, I mean, since Feynman or before. And um, in, in fact, 
Green's function can account for interactions in, in a very elegant way. Then that means the concept of self-energy that I try to explain for contacts is in fact valid in general also for interactions, for any type of interaction. Say an electron photon or a photon, an electron photon, sorry, or a photon absorption, or when we, whenever you have an electron hole recombination or an electron scattering with an impurity, all, all these mechanisms can be treated and they, they, uh, they can be treated in a perturbation theory that is called many body Green's function theory. I just show you this slide for the one that might be interested. In fact, you can build, uh, Feynman introduced this idea of, of, of writing diagrams whenever you have complicated mathematical expression. You can create, you can construct a complicated perturbation series uh, because of the, the interaction between, I don't know, an electron and a phonon can be expanded into a series and each term of the series can be uh, shown and can be mapped one to one to, to a nice diagram. The nice diagram here is that the electron propagates with a, say, an unperturbed Green's function then interacts at some point in space and time, like let's say emit a photon uh, or a phonon and then reabsorb the phonon. And this object is a self energy for the electron phonon at the lowest order. And you can construct uh, all a series of uh, perturbation. And in the end, you, you realize that the Green's function is really uh, something that looks like that. You, look, you have the self energy of the leads that we introduced before, but you also can add uh, the electron ion uh, self energy, the electron phonon self energy, photon, electron, electron. So all, all the interaction can be uh, mapped into appropriate energy dependent self energy. Of course, this is the theory then computing them is another business, but uh, uh, okay, in principle, you can do that. Uh, see. So if we look at an actual device of one quantum well, for instance, now in a quantum world with all this Green's function description, these are the typical diagram that you can construct. Basically, this is um, the density of states, uh, occupy state, a photon arrives, uh, absorb, uh, an electron is photo excited. And then if you look more in details, you can really see th these are the, um, the, the, how the states look like in, uh, from the Green's function calculation. And you can also see how the states spills over this barrier. You can, that, that famous, that important problem of of taking out this electron from, from this well uh, can be computed carefully with this uh, non-equilibrium Green's function machinery that allows you to quantify. You, and you see that the electron are also found uh, at energy lower than the top of the barrier. This is a famous quantum tunneling effect. So there is a, a good probability for the electron to exit uh, this well, and also the old can do, can do the same. So you can practically quantify uh, rigorously uh, the photocurrent uh, in a quantum mechanical way, all consistent. And this work, I took slide these images from work of uh, Urs Hebra that was uh, in the group of Anna um, Julich working just before the beginning of, of eco project. And, but then he left and, and then is where basically I stepped in. Um, okay. Do you have question perhaps or, sorry, I make a little bit long introduction, but I think it's, um, it's useful to, to get uh, into, the, into the business. Now we will start playing very soon to with the code. 
Uh, no, no problem, Alessandro. I don't think you were very long. Just a quick question for your side. Given that this is a very limited audience, do you want us to ask the participant what their background is and if they want to have any specific question to ask you? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go through the list then. Um, Mr. Ronchetti, uh, can you give us a few words on your background on these topics? Okay, no answers on that end. It's <laughs> uh, Excuse me, did you call for me? Sorry, uh, not yet, but I was moving to you. So yes, uh, Amram, right? Can you give us a few words yeah. on your background on these uh, topics on materials? Uh, actually, yes, I'm uh, working on polyuric aromatic hard hydrocarbons, including the graphene, and uh, uh, I'm trying to calculate the uh, absolute energy uh, with the Abinishu method for the uh, some graphene structure. So somehow it's related, but not completely. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Mr. Quetcholi? Uh, okay, no answer then. Mrs. Donofrio? Very little reaction on these ones as well. Um, the last one in the list, I don't know. Uh, Vorshesh Seligal? If there's anyone here. Okay, no reaction on there as well. Okay then, okay, we'll, if there's no question I mean, at this point, we'll then move on to the first uh, actual part of the experience in the introduction. Alessandro, um, I, I'm sending the ball back to you. Yeah, I can continue if there are questions, of course. Of course. Ask at any, any moment. I think questions may come when we do some practical things. But I, as I said, this is the background or the context because the calculation we will be able to do are a little bit far from photovoltaics, you know, in a sense. Um, although I will try to put them back to, to in context. So, but let's move on. Um, okay. Okay, so Urs Eberhard code uh, is a kind of um, is very advanced in many respects. You have a full non equilibrium Green's function with uh, electron photon interaction, electron phonon, uh, polar optical phonon, non polar optical phonon, uh, mm -hmm. and there is also uh, electron impurity. So there, there are lots of scattering uh, mechanisms, even uh, the famous recombination, uh, or let's say, uh, like I mentioned, the, the electron and hole can recombine because of impurity mediated state. That's also included, uh, was included by Urs in, the, in this non-equilibrium Green's function business, which is not at all trivial. Auger, to some limit has been also included. So a, a, a very sophisticated code. However, there is one small uh, drawback of that code that it, it is uh, based on, on the effective mass approximation of the semiconductor. What do I mean? Uh, uh, probably the, you know that uh, if you look at the band structure, say of gallium arsenide, the uh, effective mass means approximating with a simple parabolic uh, uh, dispersion, the minimum of the band. And that parabolic approximation can be completely wrong, especially if you go or can give completely wrong results if you have very narrow, uh, narrow quantum well. Why? Because the narrow quantum well pushes the energy of, of the of the first states, you can see here, the, the, the ground state of the quantum well is higher up than the, the bottom of the band. This dotted line is basically the bottom 
of the valence, uh, the conduction band in this case, and the valence band of, of the material. A and um, the narrow you make the well, the higher the energy. And of course, if you go away from the bottom of where the parabola, the parabolic effective mass uh, works, you, you de deviate more and more. There are simple, or let's say not so simple in the end, uh, approaches like k.p that corrects with multiband, like the famous eight band k.p model that fits a lot better the bands on a, on, a, on a wider energy range, on a higher energy range. Better even is to go to tie binding, empirical tie binding model can give you a sort of full band approximation or uh, more and more sophisticated approaches like, uh, of course, the ab initia is on, on the, on, let's say, the higher end you know, of these um, possible approximations. So, I, um, of course, we would like to have a multiband approach. But unfortunately, rewriting a code when it's written in, in, in a way is not that simple. You basically need to rewrite it from scratch. Uh, a good thing is that I, I was developing since long time this LibNEGF code that in a way is simpler than, than PVNEG for that I mentioned of developing newly, <clears throat> but uh, it had the idea of being interfaced to, to different type of Hamiltonians. In fact, we interface LibNEGF to finite elements, finite differences, uh, um, empirical type binding, or DFTP plus. And actually in this BioVia material studio, there is essentially uh, the Dassault uh, uh, software. It's even interfaced to Dimol cube, so the ab initio code. And more recently, I also interface to phonon transport. So if you, if you download the DFTB plus suite, you can also calculate phononic ballistic phonons with, with it. It's an LGPL library written in kind of modern Fortran and, uh, and maintained on, on GitHub. So uh, can be freely downloaded and uh, interface to other code. At the moment within this eco project, I'm developing heavily the electron phonon interactions and Later on, the electron photon will also be added. But the interaction, although I studied them, but they were never written down in the, in the general LibNEGF library. Okay, I probably don't, can skip this slide, but the idea is to, to provide with a more comprehensive theory that uh, with non-equilibrium Green's function allows to treat uh, let's say quantum system, not only three, five super lattices, but also quantum dot or, or, or more complicated, fancy uh, materials that may come up in the next years. And uh, of course, Green's function are computationally demanding because we are working with objects that are typically large matrices and they tend to be full, uh, not sparse, but uh, dense matrices. So it becomes really computationally demanding in terms of memory and, and, and also uh, real numerics. And there is also a lack of freely available codes around. Actually, the famous Omen Nemo codes developed now by Mathieu Lusier, for instance, um, and for the, the, this project started in US uh, in Purdue by Gerard Klimek. But these codes have never been really, really freely available. Yeah, in principle, you can ask for the source, but they, they will never get the code actually. But the, these codes are amazingly big codes scaling on, on HPC, but again, as I said, not being freely available uh, makes it uh, makes them limited in terms of uh, usability. So this also motivates the, the, the LibNEGF development. Okay, in this tutorial, the idea is to look at basic calculation of even simple coherent transport in uh, different type of system. 
And we will use this LibNEGF interface to the DFTB plus code. DFTB plus is a density functional based type binding. So trying to simplify uh, a bit uh, the density functional formulation, essentially looking at, uh, at the type binding formulation of the density functional approach. Uh, it works for some materials very well, carbon and all the carbon next uh, to carbon atoms. I cannot say it works for everything, otherwise I would be lying. Uh, there is a careful parameterization that needs to be done. When it works, it's beautiful because it, you, can give, you can get accurate calculation, almost DFT quality at uh, a fraction of time that can be 100 or 1000 faster than, than typical DFT. That's why we, we like it. But of course we know the limitations. So you, you have to test <laughs> what you're doing. Um, for this tutorial, I ask you in advance to install JML just because, but I will show you the, the structure. And in principle, if you didn't manage to install this too simple converter, unfortunately, uh, DFTB uses this generic format for the atomic structure, but JMOD doesn't understand it. So we need to convert it to XYZ file to, to give it to, to JMOD to visualize. That's why it's good if you have these two converting XYZ to Gen and Gen to XYZ, but you don't need them because I already uploaded on the web interface the, the XYZ. Uh, structure as well. Uh, JMOL you may need if you like to, to see the structure on your own computer rather than, than mine. Um, okay, starting more on the tutorial side, let's say we, we would like to look at a system like, like this. Actually, let's see if I can manage. Okay, this is already with the, a vacancy into it. Uh, Let's start with the ideal. If you, I will show you where to download the structure. Okay, this is the, our graphene nano ribbon and you can download this structure from the portal. So you go to this QCG and you log in. Hopefully you already have your credentials. So you can log in and uh, Okay, this is the portal for the actual DFTB plus interface. If you also log in into EB system, I mean, you have two ways. Either you, you, you go via select file and you enter the EBS or you directly log in onto EBS. This is the, the link. Actually, I can post it in the chat. Uh, I put everything on shared. So if you log in, probably you get to spaces and then shared. And then I, there is DF DFTB tutorial. And um, there I uploaded some structure and maybe I will upload others. Let's see. You can, you see the, we have the XYZ counterpart but the gen file is the one we will need to, to give to the, to the DFTB interface. But the, you can download the XYZ, just clicking on it and then download. Probably will place it into the download folder. Then you can move it around where you like or just open from there. Um, yeah, with a simple drag and drop, if you open also JMOL, you can drag from any folder. I put everything into, into my desktop. So yeah, I have, let's say the ideal structure. You can drag drop onto the JMOL and it should open the, the structure. So this is, a typical, you need to provide atoms to the, to the, to, to, to really build the structure. 
And then the next step, we need to instruct the code to partition the, the structure into uh, tell where, where the contacts are and where the, and where the device is the so-called device or active region or central region. There are <laughs> different names for the same concept. The concept is, as I mentioned, we, we need to partition the system in something that will look as a regular two pieces of a regular uh, contact. We call these principal layers in the sense that a principal layer is uh, a layer of, uh, of a device. Of a, of a material that interacts only with its nearest neighbor layer. So there's no interaction with the next neighbor, second neighbor. Um, ah, the fundamental point is that the formulation of all these Green's function works very well in local orbital Hamiltonian, like atomic orbitals, Vanier functions, if you know. So plane wave don't work very well because plane wave are all over the place. So a plane wave at, uh, is interacting with all other plane waves. <laughs> and then this partitioning mechanism doesn't work. It's much more complicated to calculate the self, the embedding self energy uh, that the local orbital representation is the one in, in use to, to do this calculation. So even if you work with plane waves, say you, you do a calculation with quantum espresso, you need to convert to Vanier function. This is a big part of the eco project as well. And we are still working on it, but um, yeah, you, you need to go to some local orbital representation. Then we, we partition the system into a central region. The, the, the prescription is that the central region must come first. What does it mean? in practice. I don't know how much you use with JMOL, but I find JMOL fantastic because you can do several things uh, with the help uh, of the console. For instance, you can say select uh, all means select all atoms and you can visualize, okay, with this, you have selected all atoms. Uh, now I can, let, let's see, select the first atom, say atom number less equal, less equal, I don't know, 340, I think was the, yeah. Uh, you see the first 340 atoms are the central region and they must come first in, in the structure. This is because the, yeah, the FTB plus and, and Viben EGF specifically understand that. Uh, when we developed the, the, the thing, we, we thought uh, it's not a good idea if we start reshuffling atoms. So in principle, we could have reordered the atom inside the code, but then you enter with an input structure and you exit with an output structure that is different from the input. Uh, maybe it's not that good. So we decided that the reordering should come out outside. In principle, we have some tools. If you download later on the entire DFTB plus suite, there is also a tool called Setup Geom that allows you to, to reorder the atom if you come from a, relax, a, a structure that has been relaxed by some other mean. Now, the atoms are never ordered in the right way for, for the transport calculations. So, so, but, but there are some tools to, to simplify this procedure. Okay, here I already ordered, of course, the structure. You have the first 340 atom in, at the beginning, and then say from atom uh, 341, in this case, to, uh, so you can select uh, and atom number less equal what? We, we these layers, you see these um, these layers actually all have sixty. You can use the shift. You can select this selection tool and use the shift and then drag a selection. This is quite useful. Okay, here the selection works in a negative way. The first thing is to say select none. So no atom are selected, then you can select uh, 
say these atoms. This is our units of uh, what we call principal layer, which is thick enough such that the interaction are always between nearest neighbor layer and, and each of these layer, this is an ideal regular structure. Each of these layer comprises 68 atoms. In principle, there is uploaded in the, in the interface here, you also have, where is it gone? Yes, you have this PL, it's called GNR PL for principal layer. This is the unit, is a gen file for that describes the, the, this unit with the periodicity vector set already in the correct periodicity vector. Actually, we can inspect what a, a gen file looks like, if you like. <laughs> a gen file is like, oh, this is Windows. Ah, vabbè. You, can, you can see that the gen file is a simple file that similar to XYZ, a little bit different, but, but similar in concept. You have the number of atom, the species, and then the XYZ coordinate of each atom. And at the very end, there is also room for uh, the supercell vectors, the, 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 the periodicity vector. Um, okay, here it's a bit, there are three numbers, basically, a three by three matrix that um, uh, are the three uh, lattice vector of the system. Okay, so we have the first 340 atoms that are is the central region. And then, and then, where is my J mole here? Okay, then we have contact, uh, uh, the two contacts that comes just after, which are here. So if you select manually the two contact, you see that you have 136 atoms selected and uh, nice things of JMOL, you can say print uh, selected with the selected with the braces selected. Yeah, it tells you, unfortunately this print selected is zero based. I mean, the, the numbering of the atom for some reason here start from zero, uh, but not the label. So oh, but there is a, a one shift. Uh, but, but you, it tells you that you have all atoms here selected from say an atom number 477 actually to 612. So there is a, all the, the last atom of the system. If you go on the other side, this is the other contact, you select them, okay, and unselect these. And if you look again at uh, print selected, you have the other. You, you see that there is a shift uh, again by one. The atoms here are for, from three, four, one. So the immediately, the atom immediately after the central region, two, four, four, seven, six, actually. Okay, so this is what, why this is important because we start from, from here. What we are going to do now, is having this in mind, we can start, uh, what we want to do is compute the transmission uh, across this ideal system. So the ballistic transmission, ballistic because there's no scattering involved. Uh, there is no electron phonon, electron photon, or even impurities because this is really an ideal regular structure. So we will end up looking at ballistic transport in, in this object. Um, ah, and an important, another small ingredient is that the system itself, the central region, is convenient to, to uh, divide the central region into, into layers. Uh, they don't have to be regular. 
uh, like the contact. The two contact has to be two exact copies of each other, two identical copies. Why? Because the, 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 the program needs to compute uh, from these two identical layer needs and the interaction between them it's basically extrapolating a semi-infinite repeating uh, this is the modular uh, a modular semi-infinite object that means we have only layer one and two but in practice it's like providing also three four five six infinite because this is a modular uh, Hamiltonian let's say that periodically uh, reproduces itself and also on the other side of course the central region is doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily uh, periodic at all uh, can be anything the central region so the same but, but it's convenient still to group the atom in the central region for numerical reasons I don't want to go too much in the detail but the Green's function calculation uh, it's a big matrix and, and maybe you, you've already spotted that you need to invert. The Green's function is formally the inverse of this object. Now the central region, why I'm talking all the time about a matrix, because we have 340 atoms. Each atom is described in this case by an sp3, sp3 orbital. So we have s and p orbital. That means four orbital per atom. And a simple calculation brings you to 340 times four, uh, whatever it is, it's 1360 uh, degree of freedom, let's say. So in this case, you have a, a matrix of 1360 by 1360 elements. Luckily, you don't need all of them in the end, because for instance, the density of state is almost all, almost all the time you need the diagonal of this matrix, let's say, to simplify, oversimplify the thing. Uh, however, um, yeah, there, is, there are ways to simplify like um, a trick uh, called selected inversions, for instance. You don't invert the entire object, but you invert only selected entries. And uh, this is a famous Paxi library that is interfaced to um, uh, Transiesta, for instance. Transiesta is the transport version of, of Siesta. Um, yes, and, uh, but I didn't develop yet the selected inversion for several reasons. One is that when you put interactions, basically you're doomed because everything turns dance again. So the selected inversion well, with the interaction doesn't, doesn't really work. Uh, there are other tricks to avoid the entire density, the dense matrix inversion. In, in LibNEGF, we use a block recursive algorithm. Uh, essentially, it's an algorithm that chops, exploit the chopping of the system into, into layers and, and simplify the, the numerical burden uh, with a sort of uh, divide and conquer approach in, in a way. Um, and therefore it's convenient to chop the system into, into layer. Of course, you cannot make the layer too small because they, there is a sort of range of interaction between atoms in the FTB the range is not first nearest neighbor, it's much longer range uh, because the wave decay exponentially, but uh, they don't die immediately to zero. Uh, rigorously, they can extend a few, few angstrom apart. In carbon, for instance, five angstrom, it's the typical carbon-carbon interaction distance. Okay, so the, the layer has to be a bit thick, like in this case. So if we go to the portal, we can start doing something. We can select, okay, we you start from selecting the DFTB template. 
And uh, we start from the geometry tab. There are several tabs and numbers to, to fill in. I tried to, to make uh, sort of, okay, it is very restricted compared to the uh, full input file uh, capability of the FTB, but uh, we try to, with the help of Damian, actually, we should give credit to the big work that was done uh, by a collaborator of the group in, in, in Poland um, uh, in developing all this graphical interface. So we start by selecting a file. If you go to the shared data on, on IBIS, you can go to the tutorial and then we start selecting this ideal GNR not the XYZ, but the Gen counterpart. So graphene nano ribbon ideal 5PLs is for me to remember. You just click on the on the on the file and then file select the widget submit and that prepare the yeah the system for reading this file. This 5PLs, again, is a reminder of this chopping into five layers in the central region. You see these five layers. Of course, I created this structure starting from the unit with a script called BuildWire that probably I ask you to, to download and install. But to cut it a bit short, you can you can download the PL and, and make with build wire uh, a structure that is an, uh, an ideal object with as many layers you want in the central part. You can have a look at the manual around of the FTB and uh, ah, by the way, most of this tutorial is taken from this website. And actually, let me go to another. Let me miss that. Yeah, first of all, for some background knowledge, if you if you're interested, there is a, a web page of the FTB. Uh, which is dftb.org, and this tutorial is extracted from this dftb plus recipes, where you have a deep introduction of many capabilities, and I'm taking this electron transport part. So what I'm talking about all the time, uh, I've been already introduced, is this partitioning and everything that can be can be read uh, here in, in, in great details. And in the end, uh, electronic transport, okay, electron transport in armchair nano ribbon, we, we are following now this part of the tutorial uh, with the idea to arrive to calculation of transmission. Uh, this plot is what we are aiming for as a first example. So, okay, we have uploaded the structure. We, are, we, we need to select a data set. Now, the FTB is a type binding. So there are, the good thing is that you can map, um, that you can pre-calculate and pre-tabulate the Hamiltonian matrix elements and they are tabulated and pre-computed essentially and set into, into some files. Uh, and there are different data sets for different materials. Um, some more deep details of that, if you're interested later on, can be obtained from, from, from here. Uh, all the parameters can be downloaded. Uh, and you see you have data set of different subset of parameters. Unfortunately, there is it is far from covering the whole, the whole Mendeleev table. So uh, yeah, because it's a bit painful to obtain accurate and reliable parameters. 
earlier I did, luckily or hopefully it doesn't. A good data set that contains carbon is MIO set. MIO should stand for organic uh, at some point, organic uh, data set. Another possible is PBC, which should be okay, or, or math science that have actually similar. Uh, all these contains carbon and hydrogen uh, and, are, and are okay. So, but I obtained the calculation using the, the MIO set. So in principle, we can uh, try to re reproduce them uh, again using the MIO set. Actually, later on, my hope is that we will have time enough to, to do also some boron nitride stuff. And boron nitride is, you can find boron only in this math science uh, data set. So in principle, maybe for comparison, we can we can try the math science uh, data set. So you can choose either. Uh, maybe there would be some tiny difference in the energy level position. So the, 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 maybe we will not find exactly the same uh, results using different data set. Mio is okay. Uh, this cutoff distance is this, okay. We will come to that later on. Uh, here you need to manually specify the number of atoms, unfortunately, because this interface doesn't read directly the input file. So we need to know that there are 612 atoms. How do you know that? Because you do a select all and it tells you you have 612 atoms altogether. So here you can approach it and then use the key up and down or left, right to adjust 612. This has to be precise, otherwise the code uh, later on crash. So 612, and then you, we need to specify also the layering. Um, there is no automatic recognition inside the, the PEN-EGF. So you need to say how many layers you have in the system. This also gives you the freedom to, to just describe everything with a single layer or, or, or partition differently. Uh, this is not a supercell. So this has to remain unflagged because it is a nano ribbon. In transport calculation, you have a transport direction, which is never really periodic. But the system could be periodic in the lateral direction. So let's say if you have a, if you treat pure graphene, a graphene sheet, that, that would be periodic in let's say the y-axis. And then it will also be periodic in a dummy with a dummy periodicity along the z axis, the, the, the x-axis, say. Uh, typically, transport is good if you align the system along the z-axis. Of course, everything works also if you align with other axes, but um, it's a good, uh, there are good reasons to align along the z-axis preferential. So, do so. Um, okay, then once you, don't, don't push on submit, <laughs> don't <laughs> restrain from the temptation to push this button because that will start the job and the job will crash immediately because we didn't specify the other stuff. So we, we, we have the geometry and then you have to go to the transport tab. Here you need to specify the number. What we need, do we need to specify here? We need to say which is the first atom of, the, of each layer of this chopping, of this layering of the device region. Now, uh, for your convenience, I wrote the numbers here. Um, and actually, didn't upload yet this. So, well, remember these numbers that will come up later. I write them on the on the interface too, on the chart. So the layers start at one. The, the first atom. So the first layers always start at one. Then it's one plus 68, 69. 
another 68 is 137, another 68 is 205, and 273. Okay, these are the three, the five, say, uh, first atom layers, and we need to set, specify them here. So 169, 137, 205. I wrote them here because sometimes the interface crashes and you need to reput, you, you, you need to re, reintroduce all these numbers. So it's better if you have them somewhere. Then you need to say where the, the contact one we call source, just source drain as in device physics typically. In device engineering, you have source, source drain, but there's no good reason to call them this way, just a convention. Um, the first atom in the, we said is three, four, one. Remember you, you have to add one to this print selected. So we have three, four, one is the first atom in the contact source and the source stops at uh, where it stops at four seven six four seven six uh, again each each contact must contain two of these layers uh, so you you see two repeated units you may wonder why I didn't use, I didn't choose, even, even this could be a layer, if you think. You see that this, this, this cell is repeating periodically itself. Uh, I didn't choose this size of the cell because the interaction of the carbon atom extends a bit further away. If you, if you measure with the ruler, you see that this carbon and this carbon are 5.68 angstrom apart. It might happen that the code complains because it sees um, an interacting carbon-carbon. So there is no nearest layer interaction. To avoid that in the, in the and for, for boron nitride, that would be necessary. To avoid that, you can indeed in the geometry, this is the cutoff distance I'm, I'm, I was talking about. You can, you can really put a, a low cutoff distance, but that of course will also introduce some approximation, further approximation on the approximation. You say, okay, I have, I say I cut off the interaction between atom at five angstrom. If you do so, this is, Actually, this is atomic units in the interface. Uh, so five, uh, five angstrom are roughly 10 atomic units. If you specify 10, then the nearest neighbor interaction will, uh, the, the interaction between carbon atom will be cutted abruptly after 10 atomic units, which is about five angstrom. But I would say that yeah, we, we, we leave with the with the default that I left uh, fifteen atomic units, so a little bit bigger. Um, okay, then we specify the lay the, the indices of atom of the contact source. Let's specify first the indices of contact drain. So we conclude that that stands at four seven seven and till the end, six, one, two. So all the atoms are covered. Fortunately, these things have to be done manually and there's no, well, more or less in every code in the end. Uh, there are some code that do it automatically, but of course, whatever you have automation, there is some <laughs> something some assumptions that you then have to fulfill. An important number is this PL shift tolerance. Now the default is quite small, but there are some structure later on that don't run because this, what is this 
shift tolerance is that, uh, okay, these are two copy, two identical copies of, of the same unit, but uh, how identical they are, it means that this atom has a counterpart here, right? I mean, these, these two atom, this atom shifted, uh, did I say something wrong? Yeah, sorry. Uh, let's make it correct. So let's say these are the two units. That means this atom maps into that one. Okay. This atom maps into that. That means that they are really shifted identical copies uh, of one each other. But the shifting might have an error. I mean, a small error of a tiny fraction of, of angstrom, especially if you have pre-relaxed the structure that, that there is a lot of small noise. Um, so you should increase this PL shift tolerance even quite a lot. Uh, if you don't have a perfectly ideal system. So I would say that we should use 0.01 to be on the safe side. And I also put here the ranges of the two contacts for if something goes wrong, so we can quickly retype re everything. Okay. I hope you are following so far. So this is really describing all the geometry of the system. We can start by setting zero potential on the two, on the two contacts. So equilibrium, equilibrium situation. And uh, we can go to the Hamiltonian tab. Now, luckily the next things are easier. We start from the simplest calculation possible, which is a non-self-consistent. Later on, I will tell a bit more about this, what self-consistent means, but that's some flag, self-consistent. That means that is no charge, self-consistent in the charge density, basically. No charge, no Poisson. Poisson is the, um, if you have a charge distribution, you, you solve Poisson equation and you get the potential. The potential goes into the Hamiltonian and that's what self-consistency is all about. Um, so we unflag CC, we unflag Poisson. Here we set, select only transport, no, not all the machinery to calculate the density. So no transport. The system is non-periodic, so no K points. Probably know that K point is to treat periodic system uh, via Fourier, Fourier transform, essentially. No K points. However, we need the K point for the contact calculation. Why do we need K points for contact? Because contacts by definitions are always periodic. I mean, a contact is computed, pre-computed by the code. And um, what the code does is to take out, af after our specification, it takes out the, the, these two layers for the contact and builds um, a bulk, a semi, uh, no, not semi, really an infinite system. Why this is needed? because we need uh, the isolated system, the isolated contact uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, so we need a pre-calculation uh, that is run automatically via this interface. If you, if you use the, let's say the, the, the standard DFTB code, you need to pre-calculate the contacts. And, and the contact, are periodic, so you need a periodic sampling uh, of the K of the brilliant zone, the, 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 this K point. Mm, okay, a good sampling is, for instance, the, the more K point you put, the, the, the finer you, you or the more 
uh, you are sampling this Brulen zone. Uh, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't, well, think that a periodic system with periodicity A, reciprocal space uh, maps to a pi over A or two pi over A actually, minus pi over A to pi over A. And we sample only the positive side because there is always, uh, almost always, a K to minus K symmetry. Time reversal symmetry implies uh, K to minus K symmetry. So we sample only on the positive side. Uh, and in fact, if you specify, say, 8K point, a mesh of 8K point, uh, basically you only have four. Why? Because you did all the minus side is automatically included. So you, if you specify eight here, in fact, you have four K points in a regular mesh. And you can specify this 0 0.5 shift. If you, don't, if you leave zero, you have this unshifted grid that includes the gamma point, uh, but you see it's not really even it's better to shift by 0 0.5 uh, that is uh, taking this shifted grid that is evenly uh, sampling the, the Brulen zone. So it typically is a bit better to, to put a, a shift of 0 0.5 here. But it, it, uh, I mean, even if you, if you leave zero, it's not the end of the world. Probably the calculation will be okay. Okay, so again, Hamiltonian, we unflag everything apart from this K point and weights. We leave eight and 0 0.5 here. Uh, the last is temperature. Well, typically physicists work at <laughs> many times at zero temperature. Okay, here we are just computing transmission, so it doesn't really matter. We can keep zero temperature. Uh, okay, and then this is the last uh, important thing. We, we, we will calculate the transmission and the density of states in an energy window, and we need to specify this energy window. Uh, the energy window is in electron volt. Uh, consider that the Fermi level or the work function of graphene uh, is around minus 4.5. So Oh, the work function is plus 4.5 and the Fermi level in equilibrium is about minus 4.5. So if we go from minus 6.5, say, to minus 2.5, we are covering around the band gap, essentially, quite a lot. Uh, here is good if you put something like 0.01, uh, energy grid. So we have a, a nice figure in the end. Of course, the more point you have, the longer the calculation will, will take. But this is the, the range that should work. And finally, so we specified everything. I hope I didn't log out. Uh, Okay, then we, we, we need to specify the resources to, to send the job to the, to the machine. Uh, this is uh, certainly a short job, less than an hour, should last uh, oh, some minutes, a few minutes. Um, and the, ideally, we should go to the custom side, the allocated resources should, go, should be customized. Um, why? Because unfortunately, we need to think a little bit. Um, Ebony GF is distributed, uses uh, actually an hybrid open MP MPI distribution. And where am I? Okay, it uses an hybrid distribution. And you need to think a little bit of how the uh, supercomputing infrastructure is actually uh, built in order to, to decide how to distribute the job. 
why because for instance we run the the, the word jobs on, on eagle eagle is made by uh you see intel xeon um, cpus and typically two times 14 or i mean there are also some two times 16 but typically the jobs are sent on two times 14. so what does it mean we, we have two every node is made of two twin cpus each having 14 cores so we can distribute uh, what is parallelized in Liban EGF? Uh, essentially, the energy calculation. Every energy is independent from the other, at least until you don't have interactions. So, uh, and even every K point, if you have parallel periodicity, like uh, you know, if you do a, a supercell calculation, you also can parallelize K point and energies. Here we only have energies in the end so for the transport calculation. Um, so uh, you, you can do the, actually different type of distribution. For instance, we have 28 cores on each node. That means we can send 28 MPI task on, on each node and then uh, one CPU per task, basically. To, the, the product of the task per node and CPU per task should be 28, more or less, always. <clears throat> so 28 times one is a, is a choice. 14 times two is also a choice. We, we send 14 tasks and, we, and there is an open MP parallelization inside uh, for some subtask called the linear algebra solvers for the Green's function are then parallelized with OpenMP with two cores per task. And this is still quite okay. And now if you go to 7.4, uh, which is also 28, this is not very good because what happened is that by, by construction of this, in this case, uh, some MPI uh, task will run across across two CPU basically by, by construction because you can uh, you can start putting seven on this side but then the four OpenMP thread will start for, for some task will will run across uh, NUMA domains essentially will will run across. Uh, CPU that don't share memory typically because the memory is shared within one, at least at the, 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 the lowest uh, level cache. So this is probably uh, eating performance a lot. It's not a good idea. 6.4 is good again, but I draw it in yellow because uh, you, you're underusing the machine. Six times four is twenty-four, and isn't, so four cores will will stay idle, basically. So you need to think, unfortunately, when when you run calculation. I I tend to like the twenty-four times two, two times twenty-four cores of Yuli, for instance, because you, there you have a lot of possible combinations. Uh, this calculation runs fine on one node, and then we put 14 tasks uh, per node and two CPU per task. As I said, you can also put 28 and then one. I think they run practically on this in the same time. 28, one or 14, two should run more or less in the same time. You can you can try. Uh, so we said 14 to, of course, this, the, the code doesn't really work on hyper-threading because it's quite memory bound. I mean, there is a lot of, um, yeah, the bus demand. So don't put too many, too many threads. You need just one task per core and that's good. Okay. Then we have 
compiled everything uh, if the interface didn't log out because of time we can write we can push on submit and if you see server error don't be worried push again push again until uh, you see unfortunately sometimes it doesn't yeah if you stay too long Bye-bye. We can quickly go through. Uh, fortunately, this is one of the drawback that we cannot reload all the all the parameter at once, but we need to put them again. So Mio 15, but now we can go quickly. Seven, one, six, 12, five layers. Transport is one, 69, 137. What did I say? Yeah, 205, 273, 341, 476. Shift tolerance, not much reduce is better. Uh, contact drain, okay, 477 and 612. Okay, then we go to Hamiltonian and flag everything. Transport only solver, no K point. Yeah, just 8.5 shift. Analysis, we said a good Windows is minus 7, 6.5 to minus 2.5 or 1. And resources, you say custom 14 tasks per node, just one node is enough, yeah. And two, if you like, you can try two nodes, maybe run faster. Let's try two nodes. Okay. So submit. Yeah, good. You, you should see if it doesn't, if it some error appears, click again on submit until you see this blue job successfully submitted and you can go and check at possible, yeah, that is executing. So hopefully should finish in few, in few minutes. And that should be auto refreshing hopefully but it takes some a little bit you see this is yellow color it means it's executed in the end it should appear green Yesterday evening, I noticed that it was a lot sort of slower than, than it used to be some days ago. So I don't, I don't know, but maybe it's, it's more burden. I actually don't know why it's a bit slower. It should take around 200 seconds. That means two, three, 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 four minutes. Okay. Okay, in the meantime, we can either have a break, if you like. When was the break supposed to be? Around 11, right? Yes, around uh, like 10.45 to 11. So we can find yeah, so out can, right now? I think we can have a short break while this is computing and... and it's a perfect time. <laughs> okay, then let let the job run. We'll have a fifteen minute break. We we'll convene at eleven twenty five. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Talk to you all in in fifteen minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Ehi, non ti stai guardando, Alessandro Pecchia? Ah, non so, la prima non Ah, ok, ma gli stava appena sotto. No, è interessante. Però che ha fatto un giro, Giuliano ha detto, va bene, un po' di a metà corso, facciamo un giro per vedere se sta ricaprendo. In pratica le notti non ha risposto nessuno, neanche il polacco ha risposto, ha risposto anche un ragazzo arabo che dice come si aveva un po' di grande. Si è andata. <ride> eh sì, si erano scritti in denti, eh, <ride> però... Forse perché non si domanda, si è interessato a quelli umani. Qua oggi c'è Serena, Francesco, Bonodore, Nicola, Claudio, Bocchietti. Non sta preparando, predisponendo le cose. Sì, sta organizzando. Sì, quando volete possiamo riprendere. Ok, more or less. Alessandro, are you ready to start again? Maybe we can right. second? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, see, apparently, at least for me, the job finished. Hopefully, correctly. Let, let's have a look. We can analyze the output. Um, 
Okay, below here you have the output files and the output directory. You can we can go directly to the output folder. Now that opens, I mean, I asked to copy almost all files. Um, so the, the amount of information is possibly higher than what we actually do need, but it's a good idea to, uh, at least for inspection, you can have many things here. Uh, this shift count drain and source are the bulk, basically the separated contact calculation. Uh, this is done uh, before the actual transport calculation. You can even have a look if you like to the standard output of the code, uh, but that requires you to download. Unfortunately, probably if the if the if the file is a bit bulky, it's not written in the interface. Uh, okay, maybe you can download, but the important bit of of the output is this transmission dot dot and which indeed is, is written here but it's better to 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 download separately after actually if you look numerically uh, you you already see that uh, you have some integer numbers or almost integer apart from numerical uh, small errors but basically this is a, a ladder of, of integers that can be one or two or three. And we'll try to understand why you, you can download that as well. And uh, another piece of information is the density of states. The full DFTB code allows you to project the density of state on whichever atom or orbital you like in this simplified web uh, interface we we can calculate at the moment the, the, the density of state on the entire uh, let's say central region so projected on all the atom on the central region uh, this can be downloaded but in fact I already downloaded and created these files and move these files to a folder actually let's move them again so i should find them exactly in download then can be moved into folder ideal okay let's move and substitute and also transmission move and substitute then you can these are data files as you can see are uh, just two rows uh, two columns you can open them with whichever software you like if you are Pythonic enough, you can use some Python tool. I'm a bit old fashioned and I, on Linux, I use still a lot XM Grace and Grace. Uh, for many reasons, I also work a lot with Windows, but just because of Zoom and all this stuff. So I, I found a clone of, uh, of, X, of Grace, which is this apt plot maybe pervert enough, <laughs> but, uh, okay, let me cancel this and let's start from, from scratch. Okay. Okay, say we want to load the um, from the ideal. So I, I have everything in this GNR ideal, and this is the transmission. If you select and, and plot, uh, in the end, you should have something that looks like this, as expected. Um, what is it? We, we are looking at energy in electron volt on the X axis and in, on the Y axis, we are looking at transmission. Transmission here is not exactly a probability of transmitting because it's not normalized to unity, but it also embeds the so-called number of channels that are transmitting. To be a bit, to make it a bit more clear, hopefully, 
I already prepared here some slides. Let me put it all together. Okay, we are what do we have here? We have a, a, a graphene nanoribbon ideal. Uh, ideal means that there is no defect, no nothing. So basically every electron that is in the either in the conduction band or in the valence band is moving ballistically across the system. In, in fact, you could calculate the band structure of, of one of the, uh, this is a calculation that comes from the band structure of the, of the system. And uh, electrons that are in the gap, of course, don't, don't move. Don't, can, so the transmission in the gap is zero, no state, no transmission. The, the electron in the edge of the conduction band start conducting. And here we have one band, so transmission is, is one up to, okay, maybe the, the energy scale of these two might not be exactly the same, but the concept is, is that. Uh, you arrive at an energy, this one, where a second band enters into, into, the, into the picture, into the game. So here electron can conduct via this band or the other band that is crossing at, at that energy. So here the transmission goes to two because two bands, so basically this is a bound counting uh, calculation uh, until we are in the perfect ideal system ballistically conducting this is what you should expect and, and, and what you should get in a way it's also a, a proof of the, that your code is, is running correctly or your calculation is also set, set up correctly uh, the same thing also happened in the valence band of course you have uh, here holes that, that move. So um, uh, with the transmission of one, and then it becomes two, and then three, when you have three bands. Uh, and eventually, if you go lower and lower in energy, at some point, you, you end up, you exhaust all the bands. Uh, the bands don't, don't go, don't stretch to infinity. Of course, there is a sort of minus 20 EV or minus 15 EV. Uh, they stop, so the transmission goes back to zero, and, and that's it. Um, the Fermi energy is typically here in the middle of the gap, as I anticipated, it is around minus 4.5. Actually, this would be a number that comes out from the contact calculation itself. In, in fact, if you are patient enough, you could... Uh, you could download uh, uh, the shift count uh, drain or shift count uh, source. For instance, let's have a look at shift count source. Uh, actually, this is shown in the window. And if you scroll down to the very end, you see that it also gives you the Fermi level. Uh, okay, this is in R3, in EV is minus four, six, eight, whatever. And this is the mid gap. Uh, Fermi level. These numbers are actually read later on by the by the FTB when it does the transport calculation. That, that's why you don't need to report that in the interface, for instance. Um, okay, and the other important ingredient we have calculated here is also the density of states. To okay, that we can uh, say we can load it. Maybe we can load it somewhere else. Uh, let's move in a second session. Mm. Bye -bye. <clears throat> we can open now. Now the file is called region one because if you're projecting several regions, you have a region with all the label region one dot dot and yeah of course this is much higher than the the other so but but you see these peaks and these are for those that may know are the the, the so-called van o singularities what does it mean the 
that near the edges of, of each of these bands, you see that the curvature goes to the derivative goes to zero. Derivative goes to zero means that the density of states in a one dimensional system like this, the density of state diverges to infinity. Uh, luckily it diverges like a one over square root, so it's integrable. So indeed we, we can still integrate this plot and get hopefully the total number of electrons. Actually, if you integrate the full valence band till the Fermi energy, you should get the total number of electrons in, in the system. Okay, so the, why this is useful? Well, because this is also showing that uh, at every edge of, of these subbands, we can easily call them subbands as they are. Uh, we, we have uh, a Vano singularity and there is a band gap. Now this is useful on its own for because of the ideal system, but we will do now a, 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 a next exercise. We will start putting some defect into the system and see what happens. Well, one, one interesting quantity one would like maybe to compute is even the ballistic conductance or current. Uh, okay, in this quantum business, until you are ballistic, you can write down a sort of simple formula to calculate current. This is the ballistic current, and, and it, what, what is it? We, we have a bias, in principle, between the two contacts. When we put the system out of equilibrium, of course, you need to put the system out of equilibrium, otherwise there's no net current flow. But if you put a bias between the two, the two um, contacts, th that means that the Fermi level is not the same everywhere, but there is a, an imbalance and, and electrons like to flow from high electrochemical potential to low electrochemical potential. So the formula for ballistic uh, transport or ballistic current is simply this. There is a factor of two for spin degenerates if you have spin degenerates. If you have an Hamiltonian that is already spin non-degenerate because of magnetic field or spin polarized transport, there's no two. But of course, there are two uh, implicitly in the transmission uh, itself. This is a E over H is by E must be there because we are uh, transmitting electrons that have carry a charge E. And H is always there whenever you have energy. <laughs> there is always H. In fact, the units are charges. H is energy per unit per time. Energy uh, simplifies and you have charge per unit time, so current. In fact, this is current, not current density. This is really the current carried by the, this graphene nano ribbon. Then you have the transmission at each energy and you need to integrate on this bias window, taking the difference of the two Fermi functions of the two contacts. So every electron goes ballistically from one, from one contact to the other with the transmission T and you need to integrate the simple formula to get, uh, to get uh, the total current flowing. Now, clearly uh, everything depends a lot on where you put the Fermi level. That would be tuned by doping, for instance. So we are back to the doping concept I started uh, at the very beginning. Uh, imagine you have doped N, and you have heavily doped N. Uh, I, I would like you to appreciate that computing exact doping with atomistic calculation is not easy at all because you need to put real atoms around. And then you, it's basically very complicated to do uh, an, uh, an actual doping. It's easier to do an undoped calculation and then to, to move the Fermi level sort of artificially to reproduce the, the amount of doping uh, that should be in, in a macroscopic system. Unfortunately, even a large doping, uh, th think of silicon 10 to the 19, 
atom per square centimeter means basically one atom every uh, well, every hundred or every thousand. So a, a cube of 10 atom by 10 by 10. So you need a, a huge amount of, of, of material to simulate uh, actual uh, doping. So in practice, you, you're not able to do that with, uh, with calculations. But you can play uh, as smart physics and move the Fermi level. Imagine the Fermi level is on the N side. So we have heavily doped, uh, or anyway, doped uh, N, our uh, contacts. And we, we do have, uh, imagine we, we have a bias applied to, to, the, to the system, uh, a bias of whatever, uh, a bias applied symmetrically also in this particular case. I assume I apply plus V over two on one side and minus V over two on the other. Uh, thanks to a battery. If, if you ground one of the two, it would be V on one and, and zero on the other. But let's keep it more or less intuitive and simple. You have the Fermi level in between and, and the bias window across. So it, the, the current calculation here is simple. You have two E over H, the transmission we said is one for the ideal system. The Fermi window is exactly E over e, e times V. Uh, and so you multiply and you get this number, two E squared over H times V. So that would be the current. The current, uh, in, in uh, you can also uh, put the, the actual numbers and you can calculate the conductance. That is the derivative of uh, current versus voltage. And this is the famous 2e square over h that is also called ballistic quantum of conductance. Uh, although a bit improper, but, uh, but okay, it's understood uh, what it means. <clears throat> and is actually 7.75, let's say 10 to the minus five Siemens. That means uh, uh, ampere per second. Uh, yeah. No, ampere per, sorry, per volt. So is uh, is a conductance, ampere per volt in an SI units. So this is, so we, we can expect our graphene nanoribbon to have such a, such a conductance. Say you put 100 milli electron volt uh, across and you can expect uh, a current of about a micro amp. You have a fa factor 0 0.1, 100 milli electron volt. So in fact, seven, seven micro amp, 7.7 .7 micro amp should flow in a, in a ballistic uh, regime. Of course, this is the uppermost, say, current you can expect in this case, because in fact, in a realistic system, you will have scattering. You will have something that happens and the actual current is probably lower. So let's move, in fact, to the next task of the of today. And one idea I had was to keep following the, the tutorial and, and, for instance, introducing a, a defect in, in our structure. Now, how to do that in JMOL is not too complicated. If you start from the ideal structure, uh, you can use this atom selection tool that is only in on, on recent version of JMO. By recent means already well, several years actually. But here you can even substitute atoms, uh, change the label, you can eliminate. In principle, you can even create new atom, move atom around. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, there is no undo button, so, so you have to be a bit careful and ready to do some trial and errors. In principle, we can eliminate an atom. And if you go, okay, you have to be careful that it doesn't, okay, that it really select only one atom. And we want to eliminate 
say the atom in the middle. In the middle means, uh, I mean, in this sub lattice in the center. Of course, you could eliminate this atom or the other atom. And then and, and you would see that the transmission change. So actually it would be instructive if some of you uh, maybe delete this atom and, and I delete that atom. So if I click here, perfect, this is deleted. And we can save the structure. Okay, suppose you, you save the structure. How do you do that? You can say, write on the console and you can say vacancy back and vacancy one x y z uh jmol <clears throat> only writes well, writes many formats but not the gen file so you write the x y z file um and you have it somewhere typically it always goes in the where jmol is installed typically or unless you keep you provide here the full absolute path in fact we can do that and uh, for instance save it into users desktop okay let's say I, I saved it in the desktop uh, be careful how many atoms are saved. Indeed, there were 612, we, we removed one, and so we have 611. I, I say that because JMO, if you select, uh, uh, I mean, if you just select a portion of atoms, it just saves that portion, which can be useful in some case, but, but you need to, to know what you're doing. So here we have 611 atoms that are saved. And then you, in principle, you need to convert that to, to gen. Now, this is why I ask you to, to install, if you could, this gen to uh, XYZ to gen. You, if you didn't manage or if you have problems, no problem. It is already installed on the, I mean, the, this geometry has been already uploaded on the portal. And if you like to, to do, to try, in principle, you can, if you are on Linux, should be simple. Uh, uh, the original files are written in C. Actually, in the DFTB Plus suite, you have Python counterparts, but yeah, you have this xyz to gen.c is, is a C file that you can easily compile with GCC. So if you go to, if you remember at the beginning, I, I don't know whether you installed it or not. At the beginning, I, I ask you to, to go to this website or this URL where I put down the, the, the original uh sources of these conversion tools in written in c and also this build wire written in fortran that is allowing you to construct a regular structure uh, whichever from starting from a unit cell i also pre-compiled linux binaries so on linux they should run right right away on windows i also tried I use Windows 7 still, so uh, probably they will not work on Windows 10. But um, yeah, in practice, if you if you have them, you can do X, Y, Z to Gen and convert the vacancy one. If you if you run it, writes on the screen. So if you redirect with the major sign, you redirect the output to, to a file, you have vacancy one.gen. So this is the gen counterpart of the XYZ file. And in principle, you can take that and upload it on the portal back. How? Well, that might be useful later on. So we can go back to 
submit a job, choose the interface, the FTB plus. Okay, here you say select a structure. Maybe you have your data on EBS or maybe, yeah, say you have your data on EBS as an example, but probably this has been already, you've already seen that, no? And you can add a file, you choose it from your local, local folder. It should be in the desktop now. Here it is not the xyz but we need the gen file so you open and create and that uploads it to your local folder but here it seems to stuck but in fact if you close and refresh it it appears on the on the portal uh, Okay, to make it simple, I have already pre preloaded again on the share DFTB tutorial. You have the GNR with vacancy. Uh, there is also vacancy two, which is another file where I move the vacancy position to another place. That's also interesting. We can have a look later on. Let's say we upload the vacancy. Yeah, uh, you need just to select the file vacancy and then file select widget. No, doesn't work. No. Share data, need this. Then tutorial, GNR vacancy gen. Ah, okay. And then once it appears here, you do file select or submit and it appears here. So this will be run by the interface. Again, we can, we can select the same data set we selected before. Uh, everything is almost identical, but we need to pay attention. And now there are 611 atoms. So one atom less. Uh, the number of layers is still the same, five. But of course, now the layers change a little bit because by removing one atom, uh, yeah, we have to be careful. And this is not even the, the structure, but I can write here the, the layers corresponding to the, the, the uploaded structure is still 169. The first two don't change, even the first three. 137 are, are exactly the same as before. But then from the fourth layer, the fourth layer is the one with the vacancy. So instead of going up to 215, it goes up to 204. So if I get to the chat, the new numbers are 169, 137, then 204, 272 for the layers. And of course, everything is one, shifted by one also on the contacts, 475 and then 476 and 611. So these are the, the new layering and all the atom indices uh, with one atom less. So this is 340, this is 475. Here, remember to reduce this accuracy, otherwise, the code complains and crash, and you have to put all the numbers again. 476, 611, potential, we keep zero at the moment, and, uh, and probably all day because we are quickly going, time is quickly tickling away, then we still do a non-SCC calculation. We Therefore, remove Poisson solver, transport only calculation, no K points. And for the contact, you can set eight with a shift of zero five. So exactly identical to what we did before. 
Analysis is still minus 6.5, same window, minus 2.5 with 0, 0, 001 uh, step. And resources also, I'd say, like before, two node worked. 14 task. Uh, just for your understanding, here we have 4 EV, 4 EV of range, right? 4 EV and 0, 0, 001. So there are 400 energy points. So ideally, you would like to spread these 400 energy points on many nodes, on many tasks, actually, because each task computes one energy. So ideally, you should use, you should arrive to 400 tasks. Now, I don't know if you if there is enough resources or if we need to queue longer. Um, yeah, maybe one can try a larger number of, of nodes to be involved. Of course, when you do production calculation, you, you tend to spread as much as you can compatible with the queuing system, etc. But in principle, two nodes should be okay. Can try four <laughs> since I would like to run faster. Four times fourteen now is a bit too much. Okay, three. Three times fourteen is three times fourteen is is okay. Okay, let's see. Then if we submit, ah, yeah, it went to straight away. Good. And actually, if you look at the previews now where that is running, we can also have a look at the previews run. And the previews run, you can back go back to the details and the output directory. Now, what I wanted to look is standard output of the previous run that probably I downloaded before and is this file. So let's try to open it uh, as a as a text file. Hmm. There is a better way to. One second. Okay, we don't do. Oh, perfect. Okay, this is the output of the DFTB calculation, and and you see it follows more or less the logic of. I mean, it loads the this SK file contain containing all the interaction. Then it tells you how many MPI nodes you have before we run two nodes with fourteen task so 28 and two open MP threads. Actually, this is all the calculation for the contact source that it really lasts few seconds. In fact, you see, yeah, it's a two seconds calculation for the contact. Uh, yeah, unfortunately here we decided to keep everything together. So the calculation goes, uh, the three steps, contact source, contact drain, and, and transport are all together. Ideally, you would like to, to do this calculation separately in order to, to fine tune, maybe, or, or maybe look at the partial results before going to the transport part, but okay. Principally, it should work, and, and then, and then you have the transport part. This is starting here. This is the transport run. Uh, and here you can see that some output change. 
yeah, this is still telling you the same number of MPI processes and open MP threads, but you see the computation of current and the parallelization of the energy of the energy calculation. Actually, there are 401 energy points, one because also the endpoint matters. So there is always one point more. And this is computing the contact greens functions, then is computing the tunneling and density of states. Uh, it takes a while. I have to check why, but I don't know why. And then all the points are all these integral, let's say, uh, energy axis points are, are computed and distributed uh, actually till the end. And at the end, it gives you a summary of the time spent. So it took 233 seconds altogether. Uh, okay, then this is a description of the output, and let's see if the job finished. How do we do? Okay, to check the job. Okay, finished. No, that was the other one. Also, new one finished. Perfect. So, if we go to the details and the output directory. Again, we have basically the same file, transmission and then still states. And you can also look at the standard output, uh, whatever. Band out is a, is a result of the band of the bulk of the contact calculation. Uh, but it's not a beautiful band structure because we only have four points. So uh, if you look at band out, you will see basically these four points of the, 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 the this, uh, contact calculation, these four, one, two, three, four. Uh, if, if you want a nice band structure, you need to put a lot more K points. Uh, so if you download, for instance, transmission, and if you download the, the density of states, We can put them together. Okay, now let's say that you we, we hide one second this one and we only look, we load the, the new calculation of transmission. Okay, sorry, one second. The new transmission should be moved first to a folder called maybe vacancy, vacancy one. Okay, we move them there. Substitute and then load. Okay, that would be vacancy one slash uh, y and here you are and you see that the transmission changed is not any longer the ideal transmission now is dramatically dropped uh, in the bands but basically electrons near the edges have basically very low transmission and well everything is quite perturbed by this single simple vacancy which is probably reflecting a lot uh, uh, the wave that is incoming and actually if you if you, if you look closely uh, I, I always suggest everybody to not to look the transmission in the linear scale but always go into the semi-logarithmic scale because it's a bit more instructive to look what happens uh, everywhere. I mean, also the most of the time transmission is exponentially dumped. So in the log scale, you you see a lot more details than in the linear the linear scale. 
And if you go down, down in this plot, you see something interesting. Maybe. Okay. You see the gap, the transmission in the gap doesn't really go strictly to zero. And this is the effect of practical effect of that delta, numerical small delta we need to put in the calculation uh, to, to get some numbers out. So the, the delta of the Green's function is typically numeric, we would put something of the order of 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five e electron volt. And this is essentially the intrinsic broadening that we give to, to, to the states. And, and then the, numerically that reflects on the fact that the transmission in the gap doesn't go to zero. Of course, the more you, you make delta small, the more this goes to zero, but it never reaches really exactly zero. If you put delta equals zero, the calculation will crash. It cannot, cannot run because you have divergency or because of the poles of the Green's function are really on the energy axis and not good <laughs> numerically, but, but it, it, provided you know what you're doing, it, uh, it still makes uh, physical sense. And you see here the appearance of states, these, two, these particular these states in the gap is um, a direct effect of the vacancy. So the dangling band of carbon in this graphene nanoribbon uh, around the vacancy produce a localized state. A localized state that actually if you do um, imagine you, you can do also uh, standard DFTB calculation. You cut out a supercell here, you, you cut out a piece of material and you uh, maybe the entire system we have here, a bit big, but can be done. With DFTB, you can do easily a lot of atom, even 100,000 atom, well, let's say 10,000 atom can be done with reasonable uh, computational, uh, but there are also uh, a lot of uh, efforts to do GPU portings of the eigensolvers with uh, magma, LC, whatever, and you can do uh, a reasonable number of atoms for material science. Uh, if you do uh, such a system, in fact, it's interesting because you can plot the wave function. If you, if you calculate a supercell and, uh, and with the standard eigensolver machinery of any quantum, quantum tool, quantum chemistry tool, and then you, from the eigen C, eigen functions, you, you plot the wave functions, you will find among them some localized states. Of course, many are fully delocalized states. But looking at one after the other, at some point you find the localized states. And the localized states are exactly are, are those, basically are these peaks in the density of states. Unfortunately, with Green's function, is you can plot local density, not local wave function. The Green's function is, is more embedding the density concept than the, the, the wave function concept. Um, but, uh, but you could do a, a similar plot uh, with some patient and time. We, we could in principle look at the projected density of state. Unfortunately with the portal is a bit more complicated because I didn't, yeah, I couldn't, uh, we already spent quite a lot of time to develop this uh, web interface and debug it. Uh, but in principle, this it could be extended in the next uh, version 2.0 to allow projected density of state. And you, you could project the density of state in this window of energy in different region of the of the of the system and then look where it where it goes. 
and for sure you will see it will go around here. This is the wave function plot. So uh, the, 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 the state is localized and uh, is in the gap and the electron that uh, travels across the system feels it somehow. In, in fact, there is a little bit of broadening due to the coupling with the, with the, with the system. And you see this state is able to perturb completely the conductance or the transmission, say, uh, near the uh, valence band edge. More, more on the valence band than in the conduction band, and especially if you look in the, in the log plot. If you go back to the linear plot, well, it seems more or less symmetric, more, more symmetric than, than it is, in fact. Um, you can also look at the density of states and, and their If we look at the density of states, and I need to compare with the other one, uh, view set comment, no, no comment, sorry, view, view hidden. Okay, now we hide this one and we take back, yeah, we take back the, the density of states. And if we reload quickly the region dot one, yeah, you see in the density of state a peak appears. Sorry, one second, I switch off the phone. <laughs> In spam. Okay, you, you see this in the density of state. You, you see the peak uh, of the of the state. Of course, in the transmission, you see it very narrow, very small because it's it's in the band gap, so it's already zero. But in the in the density of state, you see it clearly uh, a lot bigger because it's um, it's a state. It's there. It's really there. It's, it's there, although it, being in the gap, it, it's, um, there is little or no transmission across it, apart from this delta effect. Okay, so, and, and you see this, the density of states uh, is not perturbed in sub, some subbands, and, and the perturbation is basically near the edges of the valence and conduction bands. Why this is interesting? Well, in general, uh, these schemes allows you to, to study uh, defective physics. Uh, another interesting, or I think a bit interesting uh, thing one can study, but we are probably running a bit out of time. So I think it's better to skip, but you can do for instance, as an exercise, or we can leave it as an end on later on. You can move the, the, the vacancy to another side of this sub lattice. And this I left. Where is it? Okay, yeah, suppose. You move in rather than in the middle, you put the vacancy on the on the next atom. It's not anymore in the middle. And therefore, if you were looking at the wave function, in fact, in the middle is the worst place because the, the, the wave function has a as a peak. In the next sub lattice, the wave function around the Fermi energy has a, uh, is not touched too much because it has a, a, a zero. The wave function also oscillates in, in, along this transverse direction, you know, like all the modes of, of strings, basically. So depending where you put the perturbation, um, you have more or less effect. If you put a perturbation on, on, a, on a node of, of the wave, clearly the perturbation is lower, like touching 
a string with the, with a finger. If you put it where, where you have a maximum, clearly you have a maximum perturbation. And in fact, if you recalculate everything with the, with the we put in the vacancy on the other sub lattice, you will see that in this case, the, 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 the transmission is much less affected. If you compare uh, what we have just computed, which is uh, this one, you, you see that the transmission goes almost to zero inside the first gap bands. But if you, if you move a bit the vacancy, you see that the perturbation is lower, at least close to the balance uh, and conduction band edges. And, and this indeed reflects on the fact that you are perturbing less the, the, the wave, the incoming wave, and then the, the reflection is lower. And that also tells you that really where you put every atom matters and the position of atom interferences between scattering are uh, at quantum level are really uh, characterizing this, this. First one should do statistics. I should, if you want to approximate the real world, you need to, to put more of them to look at averages or ensemble averages or, or position of atoms. So it's much more involved uh, the computation. Uh, something that we haven't done at all is the relaxation. Typically you remove an atom, you expect the other to relax because of the forces. Uh, so we should run possibly a, a relaxation step of the structure after removal of an atom, which for time reasons we didn't do. Oh, and also because the interface as written now doesn't allow you really to, to relax the structure. There's no tab for relaxations, as you have maybe <clears throat> observed. So the, 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 the calculation here is maybe a bit limited, but still can do can allow, allow to do some interesting stuff. So this could be um, a job for exercise. I can anticipate in case we don't have time, we can, you can try maybe to put two vacancies. I haven't done this calculation, so it would be interesting to see how they look like. Uh, two vacancies and see you put, a, put them somewhere and see how these two interoperates each other. Uh, you can put, uh, for instance, a nitrogen substitution. Don't go to exotic atoms because then you need to be sure you have uh, them in the in the SK Slater cost uh, set for the FTB. So nit nitrogen is fine. I wanted to do well. So everything is clear up to now. Uh, do you have questions about this example? Curiosity, specific ideas. Alessandro, uh, just yes. so you know, allow me to say that we've been losing student and the, the morning went along. We just have now one person still attending the lecture. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry about that. We've lost like five or six people. Um, so what I'm suggesting at this point, this is, this being said, this is an, an amazing tutorial on the on the Libnegev on the portal so um maybe don't bother yourself too much in the upcoming minutes uh, and see if you can finish this part of the tutorial then came to a conclusion mm -hmm. and we'll use this entire morning as a full scale on tutorial for Libnegev on the portal uh, no i didn't understand the last question okay so just a full morning to yeah, I, I, if that's okay with you, I, I will in the end upload this entire video on ah, yeah, yeah. the channel yeah. as a, a full on tutorial on how to use Libnegev on the portal. Yeah, because yeah, it was extremely true. detailed and, and quite yeah. informational. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, for those that are in, for the one that is interested, uh, I had, uh, well, I wanted to put that into the context. This is a defect. And I, I thought it was interesting to put back to the context of what we are doing in, in, in the eco project. So maybe in the final, if, if some attendance, I expected 
people from the eco project to attend the, the tutorial mainly so once once we go once we reconvene in uh, in naples some of the of you can understand what we are doing and in fact we, we are dealing with the transport simulation of the silicon amorphous silicon crystalline silicon stuff and you can uh, and indeed this is just a more complicated structure of the simplified uh, tutorial but here we have an amorphous object with a lot of hydrogen saturation and dangling bonds defect so trivalent trivalent pentavalent silicon and all of these defects gives you peaks in the gap of, of the silicon of the crystalline silicon material let's say so the the main task of the eco project was to compute them with ab initio accuracy and then set up possibly this interface to do vanier vanierization of this uh, and an interface to liban egf since that was a bit slow in the development for several reasons i i did some calculation with the ftb uh, so on the on the structure but exactly like we did in fact one idea was even to reproduce one of these calculations via the portal in principle it can be done although these were run on uh, several uh, i think 48 or 96 nodes in ulix to 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 to, to make it fast enough um also because you need many of them for different temperature different thing so but but you see the, the physics is the same you have lots of of peaks uh due to these impurities inside the gap and they are also helping uh somehow the transmission in, in the end so in fact if we plot the transmission um after and we look for instance at annealing steps at different temperature we see something interesting that happens that is uh, a lot if we don't anneal the, the the amorphous silicon we have a lot of states in the gap all over the place but after a cycle of high energy high temperature annealing the, this gap is sort of cleaning up in a way that there is there are less states uh less defective states although yeah the states don't don't disappear completely they move they move to the edges of the band. We can look more closely where these defects come from. And typically, they do come from three valent silicon, for instance, that gives peaks in the, in the transmission. So there is really a one-to-one -one mapping with this tutorial. And another thing that I thought was interesting, maybe for those computing um, something that goes towards the multi-quantum well uh, transport uh, is the boron nitride. Now, boron nitride is also to the material. It's like graphene in everything apart from that we have two atoms, uh, an AB lattice, boron and nitrogen. And uh, because of the AB lattice, uh, there is a band gap, a very large band gap, in fact. A, it is an insulator at the end. An insulator is interesting because we can, an insulator, if we look at the band profile in this graphene nano ribbon, it's a barrier for the electron to transmit. And so you have, if we, if we were doing this type of calculation, you will certainly see a transmission that is quite low. Uh, because it, it is proportional to the tunneling across barriers that is typically goes as the proportional to the length, the width of the of the barrier, and this k is basically the square root of the energy of the barrier. Uh, but there is another system that is very interesting, which is a double a double barrier uh, system. A double barrier system is moving towards the direction of multi-quantum well, 
and the double barrier system has states that are localized in between the two barriers, uh, which means that if you look at the wave function, they look like uh, yeah, traveling wave on the two sides and then a localized state inside. And you have energy level discrete. So if we were looking at transmission across the system, we would see this nice picture. Actually, this is something we can do because I uploaded on the portal. Let's see if we refresh at the very beginning, probably I need to re-log in. Okay. In the shared uh, portion, This structure is a bit more involved to prepare because you, you need to substitute, uh, well, I patiently substitute atoms of, of carbon with boron and nitrogen, I relax the structure. So it was a little bit involved, but uh, in the end you have this G, GNR, graphene nanoribbon with boron nitride. So this gen file. Uh, for this calculation, you need nitrogen, which is in the math science, material science data set. As I said, you, you have to go to the DFTB plus um, the DFTB.org website and you see a more, bit more details of the parameter. Yes. Alessandro, I think we, we lost you for a second there. I think I touched some, some buttons that I shouldn't supposed to do. It, it seems to have put everything on pause. Uh, please reshare your screen because we just seem to have lost it. Ah, uh, that's what I, I touched. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What's going on? Share. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. So you were mentioning parameters. Yeah, sorry, I have too many windows open here. Yeah, parameters of the FTB are the difficult part. And um, there are many rounds, the freely available. Um, can I describe here? Yeah, there are several sets, uh, as I said, and, and you should find the one that contains the atom of your interest. Um, th these are not the fully the full complete set of possible parameters, but you can see that quickly by just a glance, you see that mainly uh, um, organics are covered, some are inorganics, but obviously not all of them. Uh, yeah, that, but this is going a bit a lot in the details of the methodology behind, and uh, obviously we don't have much time. Uh, but for this um, for this system, the boron nitride barriers is exactly like the initial system with six hundred and twelve atoms, five layers, and then exactly the same. Uh, chopping, so what, 69, 137, 205, 272, and then 341. I forgot. We wrote it in the chat window. 341, Now ah, we have to be careful. This was 273. Okay, two, three, one, four, seven, six. Here, be careful because this is one of the structure that really needs a higher tolerance in the shift. Otherwise, simply doesn't run. Four, seven, seven, six, one, two. 
So this is the structure definition. Hamiltonian, we can still do non-self-consistent. Unfortunately, I also discussing that all the machinery of the self-consistent loop needs uh, another, another lecture like this. Then we have, again, 8K point, shift 05. But of course, if people are interested, uh, I can send slide, whatever. Uh, this is minus 6.5 again, minus, but I choose this window. Of course, we can also reduce it a bit because just to make it faster, um, maybe, let me see the image. Yeah, maybe if we go to minus six, we can cut at least one EV. Minus six, minus three should be already enough. 0 0.01. And resources again, uh, customize two, three nodes, 14 tasks per node, and two CPU per task. Actually, we can try. Let's keep it this way and submit. Well, there's no magic. At the end of the day, this is what we should obtain. And it's quite different. Now, now, if you look at the transmission, it is very different from the original ideal graphene nano ribbon because, let me put the structure in front. Okay. This is the graphene nanoribbon with coron nitride barriers. Yeah, you can also directly rotate. Okay. But these are barriers, so the electron don't want to transmit. But whenever you eat a resonant a state that is localized here in between, the transmission suddenly jump to, to almost one or rigorously one. This is called resonant tunneling. In fact, this is a resonant tunneling device, which is in the end used, produced, constructed, especially with gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, um, because it has a very interesting uh, electronic behavior uh, showing negative differential resistance, for instance. If you start applying a bias here, and you say you, you have the Fermi level here, you bring this level in the resonance window of the bias, so you have a, a high current. And then when the, you put even more bias, the level slips in the gap and the current jump goes to zero, or ideally. Then there is also phonon emission, so it doesn't really go to zero, but the IV characteristics of this object it shows a negative differential resistance. It picks up, then goes down and up again. And this is quite useful for logic or electronic oscillators, uh, many, many possible applications. Uh, and, and yeah, I thought it was useful in this tutorial and it's kind of linked to the quantum well world by looking uh, yeah, looking at this transmission, and you see that you have peaks. Uh, of course, here there is also some numerics. I mean, this peak doesn't seem one, but you have to be careful because it means that the energy step is probably wrong. Uh, I mean, you should really pick the energy at which the you have the maximum here you can see clearly that there is a a strange cut so you you should put a, a finer grid to see maybe even better but but keeping close to the to the valence and conduction band you see really a transmission of one and this is the resonant tunneling across this localized the lowest localized state 
in the in the in the double barrier. Since the barrier is relatively high of five EV, you see many states in inside. Uh, I mean, in this scale, it means that we have huge barriers compared to the to the energy gap to the. Um, we have five EV on, on each side, but no, actually three EV per side, basically. But uh, we have enough barrier. In fact, if you see that as you go close to the end of the barrier, the transmissions tend to go towards unity. There is, the, 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 the states are more and more blower uh, and it converge to unity when you travel above the barrier. But of course, you have uh, an interesting physics and completely different from the original ideal nanoribbon. Uh, and in the density of states, also you have the reflection. You have these localized states that appear as uh, local peaks. With the broadening now, that it really directly correlates to the coupling of each of these states to the to the contact. Uh, I remind you that uh, broadening in, in energy maps to a lifetime, let's say in, uh, in time. So if you put an electron here, you can calculate by taking this broadening of the states and divided by H bar. You take the half of full with half maximum, we divide by each bar, and you, you get a rough estimate of the time the electron will spend in this quasi localized state before leaking away, probably a uh, femtosecond. But this is something that can be computed. So, mm, yeah, more or less, this was my. The, the, my tutorial, the idea was, yeah, we can obviously see the details, probably the job failed, great. <laughs> okay, why now it failed, I don't know, but we can also learn something from, from this failure. Let's have a look. Apparently the DFTB plus output didn't produce any output. So in this case, we need to look at the standard output and standard error. Ah, uh, you see Kelvin, Maxang. Huh? Uh, okay, here there is a more deep problem of the interface. There should be a file that had to be copied and it is not. So for some reason, this uh, boron nitride data set doesn't work properly. I don't know why, I think it was working. Bye -bye. I'm sorry about that, but we need to fix it in principle. So there is some issue with this boron nitride, uh, uh, boron nitride data set. Unfortunately, we started and then, yeah, we debugged a lot of other data set. This one I added at the very end, a few last week, and maybe there is still some, some issue with it. Don't know why. <clears throat> well, more or less, I can guess that there is a problem with this file. But if everything runs correctly, this is the type of, uh, this is exactly the result you, you, you should expect. So don't put boron basically. Uh, at the moment, we need to, to fix this issue. On the other end, yeah, just more or less is the conclusion. What we can do, we, we, you can play around with uh, putting defects, uh, nitrogen, not boron, and uh, or other atoms, for instance, well, there are not so many in the end. The myoset contains organics. There is 
hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus, essentially for biomolecule, organic molecule. Boron is seldom in biomolecules for his chemistry, it's complicated. Doesn't sit easily in, in biomolecule. Um, let's see other set, but, but this is one of the most tested and most reliable sets for this type of, of, of species in the FTB plus. Some, for instance, if I look at silicon, silicon dioxide, there are some specific sets for that. Yeah, this silicon band, it's very fitted. This is the set that we use for the um, eco calculations. This is fitted for to reproduce the silicon band structure and also silicon dioxide. You can do titanium, titania, other things. Um, but you see that there are selected subsets. This is one of the big drawbacks of the FTB. So more or less, I am done. I'm at the end of this tutorial, I hope. Probably it was a bit heavy, I don't know. And somebody disappeared. Okay, uh, well, thank you very, very much, Alessandro. As I mentioned, we've been struggling to read in students, but there seems to be more of a structural issue with this sort of event than anything else. Um, this was incredibly detailed and clear, and I must say that even I, as a complete neophyte, uh, could understand the potential of running these sort of jobs on such a tool. So thank you very, very much for this. Um, uh, just, I'll, I'll open it. If anyone here who's been staying with us until the end has any question, now is the time. And if not, uh, okay, thank you once again uh, to all of you. Uh, just so you know, from an internal standpoint, I will be sending an email to the PS Blast team this afternoon so they have a clear idea of how these sessions have been going and they don't expect too much of a feedback from the audience and see that more at the detail, several hours story on the, on the program. Um, well, thank you once again to all of you. Uh, Alessandro, really, really thank you very, very much. This was great. Um, if you think this is something that should be studied by people before they come to Naples uh, and hear you talk about Living F, uh, I let them know about it. I'll, I'll put the video and let them know that to get the clearer view on how this works, maybe take a look at the whole session to have a good idea of what the program can do. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, I guess in eco there is a lot of heterogeneity in, in terms of people working. The codes are so yes. In the end. Yes, it, it's it's clear that when it comes to this sort of event, we are struggling both with uh, dissemination list as a whole, which is reaching people from outside of the project is difficult, and from the fact that the project itself is quite heterogeneous. So each team tends to stick a bit to its own field. Yeah, um, although I think I'm, I'm the one that really arranged different fields from, yeah. I teach yeah. even Navier-Stokes equation in, in the computational physics lecture. So I, I really arranged <laughs> everything when I, because physics is nice at any scale. But okay, people tend to be a bit more. <laughs> yes, they tend to be a bit more focused on their field and their field. Well, I like cows, for instance, a lot. But <laughs> you know, yeah. All right. All well, right. That's it. Let's end this session for today. Thank you to everyone once again. Take care, and for those of you that will be joining us tomorrow, I'll talk to you tomorrow as well. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in another place oh i know you you will be i know that this is time you've managed to to free on your own from another event so please so, uh enjoy the this other thing you have at the same time <laughs> yeah i was very interested in fact to all these other tools but how can i do i can yeah. <laughs> okay but, uh, see you see you in naples then. yes see you in naples absolutely okay have a good day yeah <laughs>
<laughs> take care, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.